I love the way the First Gen Lounge makes me feel. Because it creates a space where I belong, where we're able to create community. The fact that it's a community. It's a safe place. It also gives me a place to understand different perspectives. The stories of these individuals prescribe transformational perspective. I receive encouragement, enlightenment, empowerment. And also serve as a catalyst to just keep going. Where we're able to be our true selves. I'm allowed to be an unapologetic first gen. And above all else, tell our story. And every episode is unique. I love it. I'm your host, Dr. Eve, and I'd like to welcome you to the First Gen Lounge. Well, hello, beautiful people, beautiful people. So glad that you are here today. And if you are new, what's up? Welcome. Hope that you come back again and again and again. Super excited and actually very fortunate to have today Dr. Ishelle Eady, okay? And she is amazing. Uh, no questions about it. I can tell you all the things, but I'm not going to do that because nobody can tell their story better than that person. So Dr. Eady, hello and welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. You are so very welcome. This chi town native. <laughs> Y'all, I get so excited. I, talk. I love Chicago. It's one of my favorite cities. And I look forward to going back again real soon. <laughs> like when all this mess is over, I'm definitely going to make my way up there. I just didn't even know how beautiful it was until I got to visit. But anyway, Dr. Edie, would you please tell us who you are and all of the things that you're up to and, you know, just whatever you want us to know about you because you're just amazing. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm going to start with what I do because I think it's easier to describe. I am currently the Vice President for Instruction and Accreditation at the Tennessee College of Applied Technology in Murfreesboro, including our Smyrna campus. In that role, I supervise faculty for 17 different technical programs and I also supervise student services. I have worked my entire career at the intersection of education and social services and workforce development. So I feel like this is the right opportunity and I'm the right person to be there for what I consider to be my people, right? Mm. Non-traditional, trying to make a move in terms of their trajectory, trying to do things for their families against all odds. And so I'm, I'm really honored to be able to, to serve in that role. I love that against all odds and, you know, needing to be there for your people. I love that you say that because there's so much work that needs to be done in so many areas. And I think there's sometimes a lack of connection to the work. And so for you to see it and to step in and to want to do the work rather than complain about what needs to be done, I'm going to commend you for that. (laughs) We know we see it all the time. And I just think that's really, really um, awesome. So tell us, graduating from college, you know, getting into the workforce, starting a family, going back to school, you've done a lot. What would you say has been or are some of the major life lessons you've learned along the way? Well, first of all, you made that sound kind of easy. So I want to dip back into that a little bit. So like I was saying earlier, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was a pale, almost 100 percent pale student. I had done pretty OK in high school, 3.0, you know, the whole thing. But I, I didn't do college prep. And so in my family, mm-hmm. You know, I was raised by a single mom, and she insisted that me and my brother decide between going into the military or going to college. Hmm. And at the time, I just felt like I wasn't going to be able to do all those sit-ups and basic training. (laughs) So I was going to go to college, and I started there very underprepared Hmm. and didn't have, you know, again, first generation, so didn't really have anyone to guide me in that process. Hmm. And I finished my first, we were on quarters back then, I finished my first quarter with a 1.9 GPA. Oh, boy. And it it was very, it was demoralizing. It was Mm -hmm. discouraging because the reality is I didn't really think I belonged there anyway. And I ended up meeting up with quite a few professors and advisors who apparently agreed with me. So it took me nine years to finish a four-year degree. Hmm. And not nine years straight. I don't want you to... uh, (laughs) You just semester out of semester. (laughs) In and out, in and out. (laughs) But, but you know what? I really do feel like now where I am, that makes me even more valuable, right? So 
as you mentioned, I was able to complete the bachelor's degree. I was able to go on to a master's degree and then finally a, a terminal degree. And I have to say, I did learn a lot along the way, but I learned more at 100th and Cottage Grove on the south side of Chicago about survival mm -hmm. and community and reaching back than I learned in anybody's academic program. Mm, you said something when you said that. I want to dig into that a little bit more. Why do you think of all the things that was kind of like that foundation? I mean, it is a foundation, but why that? Because there's some people who will say it was when I got to college or it was when I got to grad school. It was when I took my first job. But you were like, nah, Southside Chicago. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Well, you know, I think it's because I kept expecting, as you say, once I graduate high school and then once I finish college, well, this master's degree, that's going to be it. And, you know, I kept reaching back home for life lessons to get me through whatever I was going through. My mom originally from Morton, Mississippi, and, you know, didn't have a high school education, but insisted on, you know, education's important and that's what you need to get to where you need to be. And, and so I kind of bought into that. And I will tell you, by the time I realized I was not college material. I was graduating. So hmm. I just, you know, that self-efficacy that was planted in me, I just feel like it's my calling to, to pay that forward. Hmm. I can see that. Definitely can see that. How do you find yourself connecting with your students now because of that nine-year experience? I'd be curious to know that. Well, first of all, when my students see me, especially uh, given where we are, demographically, we are quite different from Chicago. We're not very diverse in the area of hmm. Tennessee where I am in terms of ethnicity. And so a lot of times our students don't get a chance to see someone in leadership that looks like them. And I never want to be the person to disappoint them. What you see is, is what you're going to get. So, so that's one thing I think that kind of sets me apart. Another thing is... I see potential in every student mm. and I'm not sure that for whatever reason, I'm not sure that everybody in leadership can say that. I think sometimes we subconsciously categorize students or, you know, maybe have unintentional bias with students. But I know that you can come from humble beginnings and I know that you can have a, a doctorate degree after having a 1.9 GPA in undergraduate school. So I kind of come, you know, to everybody from that place. Mm. The place of empathy. Yes. I think there's something to be said about that because in higher education spaces and beyond, what makes a difference is being able to build relationships and you can build when you can empathize more so than when it's trying to be just a strategic plan for something. Um, but I'm going to leave my two cents right there. <laughs> you know, but even thinking about the fact that you decided to go back. So, I mean, it took you quite some time to finish. And then you said, I'm going to keep going. What triggered that? Opportunity being mm -hmm. told that, and, and this is real. So watching colleagues who were sometimes different from me, be afforded opportunities that when I went for, I was told, well, you need this credential mm. and other people didn't need that credential. And I just felt like if it's going to be a master's degree to keep me from from moving ahead and to keep me from this opportunity, you have not said anything but a word. So <laughs> that is really that's really why I went back for my master's degree. And and a lot of why I went back for my terminal degree, because I, I feel like. I need to have a seat at the table because mm -hmm. of what we talked about, right? A hundredth and Cottage Grove. But I know that that credential is not going to get me to the table. Mm -hmm. So I play the game and I go along with the process, but I'm bringing a hundred percent wherever, you know, wherever I am. I can, I can understand that because <laughs> being from Charlotte, you know, I'm from, from Charlotte and depending on, grew up in Hidden Valley. So not saying they're the same, but I get that where I'm from is also the, the reason some people may have looked at my life and thought I wasn't going to get to where I am. So mm -hmm. even for you to have made it, you know, kudos to you for that. So I want to even ask you, <laughs> you know, just, just, just in a moment of truth and transparency, how have you been able to adapt or even be able to let go of your old identity to step into your new one? And what I mean by that is, of course, 
growing up in the South Side of Chicago, I'm pretty sure you saw some things that said you learned survival. There may have been things you were exposed to that if you went back home now, people may say you different. How has it been for you to just really even let go of this identity of I'm not going to be able to make it or I'm not college material? Who am I to think I belong as in a VP space for an institution at that? How ironic, right? Mm-hmm. Wow, how, how life turned, turned itself around. So just what has been that process? Well, I have brought, my nickname was Artie, right? So I brought Artie from the hood with me <laughs> and she's with me wherever I go. Sometimes we put duct tape over her mouth and make her sit in a corner, but she's always there, <laughs> right? So I know I can always pull back if, if I need to and say, all right, what would Artie do? It keeps me being able to relate to whomever I meet. But at the same time, it keeps me fearless, right? So Mm. a lot of times in in this space as an African-American woman in leadership, a lot of times you will face situations that could be intimidating, especially if you're uh, fighting through, say, imposter syndrome or, or whatever it is, you know, whatever your insecurities may be. But when you think about how far you've come, and you think about a lot of the things you've been through, that's a lot of times that can shore you up. And you can say, you know what? Well, if I did that and if I survived that, I'm pretty sure I can survive you. So let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I like that you didn't say that you let go of who you used to be. You just learned how to manage the different elements of who you are. That's what I would like to say, because... If he brought Artie to the party, right? (laughs) Artie going to tell you what's up and she's not going to think twice about it. But I think, you know, that you don't have to let go of who you are to become. So I thank you for how you answer that and for how you framed it for us. Because a little duct tape over our mouth when, you know, my mom taught me growing up, say what you feel. (laughs) You know, if it's on your mind, say what you feel. Speak what's on your mind. And so I did take that perspective into a couple of professional work environments. (laughs) And they ain't like it. <laughs> so, my, But my mom has always been very honest and very real. And so I wanted to embody that because I love that strength. And I remember the first time I was um, at a staff meeting once for this job I was in. Somebody asked me what I thought about something. I was like, oh, I don't care. I didn't know I did anything wrong. <laughs> but apparently, you know, in professional settings, you're not supposed to say that. But I'm like, I honored my truth. But I've learned how to, like you said, shape things differently or say things in a way that's more palatable. Whereas before I was like, my mom to this day is just raw. <laughs> so I'm like, I learned from the best, but, um, you know, but I like to say, just do what you can again, just know how to know when and how to let that person that's still there that's in you show up or like I said, put, put it in the corner. So thank you for right. that. Just, oh, of course. It works about 87% of the time. <laughs> Eighty-seven percent, Doc. Now we know statistical significance, <laughs> but you know. So, but has there ever been a time? Just really curious if you like to share that. Maybe you were like, "Ooh, you know, she showed up and she should have really sat down." And how did you navigate that or bounce back from that challenge? Well, you know, I will say in my youth, I was all about fairness and equity and you're not going to talk to me that way Mm -hmm. you're not going to treat me that way I basically wore all of those feelings and emotions how they say on my sleeve and what I found was that it wasn't serving me well because once Mm -hmm. I showed my entire hand I wasn't going to win that I wasn't going to win that round right so what I started doing was temporarily internalizing right not not forever because that'll make you sick but being able to be patient and watch things play out and be a little more strategic. Mm -hmm. And so, like we talked about, I I couldn't leave me behind because if I had left me behind, I would have been lost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm always there with me. So Artie's always there with Dr. Edie. But what I've learned to do, again, is be patient and realize that I don't have to win every battle. I'm not going to win every battle, but I'm still going to win this war. Mm, That's a word today. (laughs) And the idea of the timing, you know, and timeliness and knowing how to decipher if it's time to pounce on something or if you should just sit back with it. 
that's definitely a professional lesson worth understanding. But have you had people in your life to help you navigate these things as well? Just these things, just these professional workplace challenges, how you show up as a Black woman? Because I know that's a really big part of the experience, right? We just can't show up and think we can show up like everybody else. <laughs> and so who, who has helped you? What have you been able to do to, again, just make sense of these spaces and to show up as your best self and, again, learn how to manage those emotions depending on what the situations are? Wow, that has been a big part of my experience. I'm thinking back to when I was still in undergraduate school and how my first, my very first professional mentor, Dr. Bobby Bradley, who has passed on, but how she really took me under her wing and she saw potential in me before I saw it in myself. Mm. And she believed in me and allowed me to be in spaces that, quite frankly, I don't think I was always ready for. Hmm. But what I took away from that is that I need to be that person. And I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it for years until I started experiencing younger professionals kind of coming to me or, you know, in my space and watching them and seeing potential in them. And that's when I really realized what she had done. So, you know, and she she was an African-American woman. She was one of the first leaders uh, with the city colleges of Chicago. But, you know, all my mentors have not been Black. All my mentors have not been women. I try and look for that you know, that peace, right? And P-E-A-C-E, when you're in someone's space and you can tell, you can feel that they have what's best for you. They have your best interest and heart. And I, I tend to gravitate toward people like that. But even at this stage in my career, every other Friday morning, I meet with a couple of mentors, both retired uh, from higher education. And we just talk. We talk for, I'd say, 30 to 45 minutes. They're donating their time, which I think is amazing. So I always send them, you know, nice gifts, flowers, or, you know, maybe a little scarf or something just to say thank you, because they don't have to do this. But I will tell you, it's made all the difference in my current position. So... I can appreciate that to have the mentors of different backgrounds as well. How did you find those mentors or, you know, was it like conferences? They just kind of came to you. Like, did you seek them out? What was that like? Well, so what I do is I stay open, right? I stay open to messages that will guide me where I need to be. I, can, I Look, I get inspiration from rap music sometimes. Like I'm, I'm all about the message, right? Not the messenger. Yes. So... I think being authentic, working really hard, bringing everything you have to the table, people will see that. People will recognize that. And if you're in an opportunity for, I'd say, a length of time, maybe a year, two years, and no one has tapped into your greatness, you're probably not in the right environment. Mm, that's really interesting. I hadn't heard that before. And I think it's a matter of alignment, too, though. Like when I'm thinking about it out loud right now, it's like that alignment because, you know, and the fact that, like I said, nobody taps into it. Like you never think about people not tapping into your greatness. At least I'm going to say I have it. <laughs> I'm going to say I have it because, you know, it's one of those things that we assume that regardless of the space we're in, that people will connect. But you have come to say, now that's not true. And that's probably, you said, the cue or sign that you need to be in a different space. I really love that. Really appreciate that perspective as well. And still staying on the topic of mentors, what's the best advice you've ever gotten from one? The best advice I ever got from a mentor is to be patient. And I'm going to tell you at the time, I was so angry about hmm. that piece of advice because, you know, when you zoom out and just think about our experience as a people, patience like, that's all you got for me <laughs> is to be patient <laughs> after, you know, after everything we've been through. But I feel like and that was several years ago. But what I heard, so I, this is this was my takeaway eventually, is that I don't have to always push my agenda. I don't have to always push the envelope. Sometimes it's better to watch and see the natural flow of things and decide. Like, if you ever if you ever play double dutch, you have to wait till those ropes are in a certain position before you jump in, right? It doesn't matter how good a jumper you are. If you jump in too early, uh, you messed up. So that's the way I kind of took that advice eventually. That's <laughs> so funny because I still can't double dutch. <laughs> so, so I still be sitting there waiting. I still be sitting there waiting. Like I'm, 
But I think that was a great analogy. Again, going back to the timeliness, but also knowing that you can do it and that you will, but it's being in the rhythm and the flow. And I've been reading this book as of late, Asking It Is Given. And one of the things that I really take from it is the idea of being in flow. I'll be honest, when I first got the book, I wasn't able to, I wasn't open to it. I was really terrified to read it because of how it started. And I was like, this is interesting. But now that I've opened myself up to it, I allow that flow. And you're right, flow is everything. And sometimes we resist, kind of like, you know, with a, a stream. You see the stream is going one way and you try to go the other way, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> and so if you go with the flow, it'll literally carry you. So I'm definitely, I'm excited about you saying that as well. What do you think, Dr. Edie, has helped you to be successful thus far? Not giving up. Seeing how hard my mom worked and knowing that she was a brilliant woman and a strong woman and hardworking and just watching the knocks that she had to that she had to endure and her belief in me. I will tell you a quick story. My mom got her high school equivalency after I was, let me see. So I was married already. I had my youngest children already and I was already working in post-secondary education. I was working in high school equivalency programs and I never knew that my mom didn't graduate high school Hmm. because I knew what high school she went to back in Chicago and she would talk about, you know, things like prom and she just never said, oh yeah, but I forgot to tell you I didn't finish. Hmm. And You know, what that has taught me is that the whole time I made this presumption, when she finally got her GED, she called me and I was like, oh, that is so amazing. And I wanted to tell everybody. And she was like, well, no, you know, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't have my height. And I was like, mom, stop. You have raised someone to be successful in post-secondary education. Your son is an officer in the military, like you did it. And if you could do it that way, if you could make us believe in something that you hadn't even seen yourself, that you talk about some black girl magic. I was like, no, we're proud of this. And we're going to tell everybody that. I mean, how can you not keep going knowing something like that? Mm, You know, you answered the question I was thinking as you were speaking. And I just wondered how having a single mother who'd been through so much influenced you. But it's clear that it's the idea of you don't stop going. You just keep going. Because a single mother with children, what's your excuse? <laughs> you know, yeah, um, yeah. my mom, you know, similarly having been raised in a single parent household. And I I say to this day, my mom had one job, each one of her kids. And at, at the least, mm-hmm. you know, they didn't include the summers. And so for me, when I think about hard work or work ethic or hustle or being out there, you know, being able to just go make it. She protected us from all that we um, didn't know about happening. I mean, as children, there's so many things you don't know. The bills, the food, the insurance, the, you know, health care, doctor's appointments, all kind of stuff. She shielded us from that. And as an adult, I'm like, yo, she is a superhero. Mm -hmm. You know, she is my hero because, you know, though I don't have children yet, I just know what it means to be an adult and can't imagine being an adult without a spouse to help with children and then you said gotta make it and still do for yourself Mm -hmm. and so then I said I look at things and I'm like so what's my excuse you know just be really curious to know you know since we're sitting in this space too though how did your mother's parenting shape how you parent because you are fortunate to have three boys you know if I had children I just want all boys so I'm like (laughs) she living her best life with the boys so yeah so you know what does that look like you know for you and then thinking too that you still have education so that you still have opportunities you can afford them that maybe your mom couldn't afford for you all. Right. And so, well, my mom was very strict. I feel like she had to be because of where we were. And at the time, I didn't realize why she was, you know, behaving that way when all my friends could hop on a city bus and go roller skating and I couldn't go unless she could take me, you know, and and all that nonsense. But as a mom now, I really understand and appreciate everything that she did for me. I didn't understand why she worried about me because, hey, who's not bulletproof? in their late teens, early 20s. And now, you know, I get it. And so on the one hand, it makes me a really humble parent. And on the other hand, you know, I'm not taking any excuses for anything because if I could survive my mom, I don't want to hear it. I don't don't care what your friend's mama said. (laughs) You know, this is how it's going to be. So 
if I can survive, my mom, I want to hear it. <laughs> now, that's the first on the first gen lounge. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but definitely the your mom told y'all you can go to school or go to the military. The mil- when you said that, I was like, you know what? I already know what it is. Like, there's going to be some discipline, some structure around here. But then, you know, when mama speak, you listen. So I, I can appreciate that. And I mean, though we're a little bit further ahead now, I do want to go back and let you know when you were talking about not doing all the sit ups and stuff. Yeah, that's the same reason I didn't even think about it either. I was like, I'm going to let this go. <laughs> because it came up for me, you know, as an option. I was in JRTC when I was in high school. And the thing that I was always, for me, I was always the fat kid. And so I always had to, like, get the adult stuff or, you know, have stuff fixed to, to be able to fit me. But I thought about it because they would sell you on this idea that go to the military, you know, it can pay for college, you'll have stability, which I think there are some truths to that. But I was like, am I really about to do this to myself? I'm not going to pass that test. You know, I don't know if I can lose this weight. So I'm like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> so I, <laughs> but the ass bad was helpful. You know, it was helpful. Like I got to learn some things about myself. So I'm good with it. So I would be curious to knowing now, what are some of the things that you are doing to invest in yourself and continue to just make sure that you're growing, but also taking care of yourself too? Because again, being that you are an upper level administrator, you know, a mother, you have a family, you have a husband, you know, you wear many hats. So what does it look like for you to continue to exist and be well? And, you know, when you need it to just not be Dr. Edie or mom, but just to be Eshel. And I guess on some days, Artie, you know, what that looks right. like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, I use a sense of humor. I wish I was more uh, athletic. I wish I could tell you that, you know, I go running to clear my mind <laughs> and all of that. <laughs> but, you know, the reality is sometimes I just need to be at peace. I'm an introvert. I'm a severe introvert. And it's ironic because I've always worked in spaces where I had to interact with a lot of people. Hmm. So when when it's downtime, it's really downtime. It's kind of don't answer the phone, don't answer the doorbell. I, I just really need to kind of regenerate. So I, I make sure that I make that space for myself. But I'm also big on family. So if somebody's going to be around me, it's going to be someone with, you know, either marital or blood ties. <laughs> so somebody that can put up with me, even if I'm like, yeah, come over, I miss you. And then we're in two separate rooms because I'm trying to get myself back together. So as far as professionally, I'm always reading, I'm always involved in some type of organization. When I say involved, I mean, I go to the webinars because You know, I'm a lifelong learner and I'm always promoting lifelong learning. And I just don't think I could be that effective if I sat down one day and said, "Okay, cool. Now I know everything. Now, you know, now I'm a sage and now I can tell everybody else what's up. No, we're always learning. I learn Mm -hmm. from you. I learn from people who have not been in post-secondary yet as long as I have. And of course, I learn from people who have been in post-secondary ed, who have been in other roles as well, like we talked about, social services. One one of my biggest influences is Sharon Roberson, and she's currently the CEO of the YWCA of uh, Nashville in Middle Tennessee. And that would be an entirely additional podcast to talk about her. I mean, she she's everything. But even though I don't work directly for her anymore. I still watch her through social media. She's inspiring. So that's kind of how I keep myself, you know, sharp and try to stay at or near the top of my game. I'm excited about those things because it's just who you are. You're not trying to do anything that other people are doing, you know, to make sure that you are good. Like this is, like you said, this is what's good for me. So the lesson for anybody listening to this, who people are telling you your self-care needs to be wine and baths and you know going to splurge on things do what makes you feel good if it's those things then absolutely so just really tuning into that i'm excited to hear your self-care as you showing up and learning and being exposed and just doing things that feel good for you okay wait okay wait can can we go back to that because i didn't know this was multiple choice i'm not anti no i'm not saying you anti like, go ahead go ahead go ahead tell us now tell us something no, 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 no. Yeah, what you said also. But I mean, what I thought of immediately is when I'm when I'm just worn when I'm worn out, when I'm worn down. That's kind of how I rejuvenate. Mm-hmm. However, everything else you mentioned, like I really can't wait to travel again. But travel for me is not necessarily relaxing. Travel for me is more. It's a series of teachable moments. It's exhilarating. It's all those things. But 
When I'm really, really kind of shutting down, it, it's at home, my dogs, and just chilling. I can see that. I didn't say, look, I understand it. <laughs> but you know, but I think, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me go back to that. I think there are sometimes this narrative, though, that self-care has to be so many things, right? That in our society, we push stuff. And it's like, but if that don't work for you, don't do it. <laughs> so like when I'm done with my interviews on Saturdays and my phone is on Do Not Disturb for 24 hours, I'm like you, I ain't anti. I just need to regroup. <laughs> so, but no, so, so I, I fully get it. I fully get it. But just the honesty in saying like, I need my moments because you need your moments. We have to relax and reconnect with ourselves to be able to get back into the world or to whatever roles we take on and the many hats we wear and to serve. So like, no, I, I felt you on that. I just wanted to reiterate it, <laughs> you know, like do what you need to do and don't, because I don't apologize. I, my phone is on do not disturb 24 seven. Not even kidding. Unless I know I'm waiting for somebody's call, then I take it off. And it's like, well, Eve, why that? It's not that I'm anti, but I know how I'm moving within different spaces. And I know what I need to be able to gather myself. So my phone not ringing gives me some space, at least. And I can always get back to someone as well. And it's okay that maybe if we didn't reach out or connect at that time, we just weren't supposed to. And so it's just how I've been able to reframe things. So yeah, they're like, I'm with you 100%, 100%. So just as we, you know, get into a place where, you know, we are, this conversation flew by, I'm gonna tell you that for real. <laughs> it always flies, but I enjoy, you know, these moments to just share and to connect. I do want to ask you something just really quickly. What do you think we can do in higher education spaces, especially as Black women, to heal the experiences, to contribute more positively to the experiences of Black women in higher education because I was talking to a friend recently and something that we both found in common is that higher education as a Black woman, experiencing with other Black women has in some cases been hurtful and damaging and trying to recover from that when we've already sometimes getting beat up by those who don't look like us. And I say beat up, you know, it's terminology of it can be hard. People not seeing you, not supporting you i'm not understanding you like what can we do as black women to help change the narrative but also help heal what we as black women are going through in higher ed well i think you nailed it i think it is to see one another and to support one another because i've experienced exactly what you just described and so mm -hmm. what i'm trying to do it was funny when you asked me about my parenting style and what i got from my mom i told you about the positive stuff right that i was able to uh, adapt to my current situation but you know there were some things that my mom did and i know her intent was always good but i learned from kind of like the good things and the not so good things. And I do the same thing in my professional life. So I try to be the supervisor, the mentor, the leader, the friend that I've had my best experiences with. And I think about those situations where I was not comfortable. I did not feel like someone had my best interest at heart. And, I, and I'm not going to be that person. I refuse to be that person because they're not enough of us to have detractors, right? We're, we don't need anybody to help create drag. Somebody already has that job. So what we need to do is support one another. And remember, this is not a pie. There is opportunity for all of us and it may not be at a post-secondary institution. I, mm. I just think we really need to support one another. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I was telling somebody recently, I did not even begin to heal until I moved out of higher education full-time. I um, still teach part-time adjunct and I enjoy it, uh, but I didn't realize how damaged I was and how insecure I was about navigating spaces with other Black women and there have been many Black women entrepreneurs that have helped me to heal my relationships with Black women mm -hmm. and to be re-empowered in being a Black woman myself and not feeling like I needed to be anything else or that I was not giving enough um, attention to or emphasis to my Blackness. And I you know, more candidly talked about it more recently as I'm more settled. But I just think that as Black women, um, especially as in the higher education spaces, just like I said, being mindful and having people like you in positions who understand and who are empowering others, I do appreciate. But yeah, but it's just, it's interesting. I can go on and on, but it's interesting. But I just want us to be able to understand that the work we're doing is so much bigger than us and we can do so much more work if we can help each other. And rather than 
mm-hmm. fighting and bickering or throwing shade or doing underhanded stuff, which it happens. And you can be scared to talk about it in higher ed because you don't want to be blackballed or seen as that person who's you just need to be quiet and go sit in the corner. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's a reality that until we address it, we can't do anything about it. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. And so as we are, you know, at that point of the conversation, one of my favorite points, not because it's over, but because I just love wisdom. I definitely want to hear from you. What words of advice or wisdom do you have to leave us with? Well, I think I said it earlier, but just always stay true to yourself and know that if you did not have a purpose here, you would not be here. That's kind of how this works. So believe in yourself just because somebody else doesn't see your worth does not mean it's not there. Try to make your life be a combination of what you love to do and what people are always asking you to do. Because what I found is that's really, that's your sweet spot right there. So Mm -hmm. many of us do know or believe we know what our purpose is and that's awesome. But if there's anybody listening who does not know, that's always kind of worked for me. And I mean, I don't really know. I don't think I have all the answers. So I guess my last piece of advice would be to keep learning. Always Mm -hmm. keep learning. I'm with that. I love that. I always keep learning. I love learning. I was talking about it recently, but one thing people can't ever take from you is what you know. <laughs> That's what my granddaddy said. So That's real. <laughs> Amen. But listen, I have appreciated this conversation. I love the connection, and I just want to thank you for, again, the work that you do, for the lives that you are changing, for your leadership, for your fearlessness. Because I, I know, just again, how challenging it can be to go for all the things, to be Black, to be a woman, but to be ambitious, like, so we make make no excuses. So um, as I shared with you before, just thank you for your visibility to be able to help other women who are looking for that example, for you being that. I think we always understand that at some point or another, we do carry some of the responsibility, although it's not all of ours. Again, we just lift as we climb. And so to you, Dr. Edie, um, just wishing you well in all that lies ahead. And just again, thank you for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for your presence in this first-gen space. And for being a first-gen who though may have had some challenges along the way, who didn't make an excuse or give up. I've definitely appreciated that and continue to wish you well in what you do. And for those of you who have tuned in and you like, I like Dr. Edie because I like her too, right? Make sure you go to those show notes to connect with her, you know, every space that she is. We put that information there to make it easy for you. In the meantime, Dr. Edie, again, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you need anything, you know, we here at the First Year Lounge. We got you back. Thank you so much for even creating this space. This is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely appreciate that. All right. Until the next time, 